Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today, we are going to be studying something that uh, more, more than likely, there's going to be quite a few people outside the class that uh, don't really think about very often. But I can tell you over the last four months, I, I'll explain this later, that um, I have been uh, in major, major thought of God's glory all the time. And I'll explain that in a little bit. But what we're going to talk about today <coughs> is our created purpose. There's a lot of questions that people will, will ask. They'll say, uh, like, for instance, what is my purpose in life? Or what is the pur purpose of my existence? You'll hear people say you know, certain questions on that, on the, that, that topic. A self-help self advisor, I went on, just, for, just for, uh, for fun, I went on different websites to see what people were saying about what their purpose in life is. And unbeknownst to me, no one had any purpose of glorifying God. Self-help advisor Steve Plavina says that if you empty your mind and rapidly write down, possibly for 20 minutes, what my, what's my purpose in life? Usually it takes 15 to 20 minutes to clear your head of all the clutter and the social conditioning about that, what you think your purpose in life is. The false answers will come from your mind and your memories, but when the true answer finally arrives, it will feel like, like it's coming, from, uh, coming, coming to you from a different source entirely. Hmm. Here, it, here was my final answer. This is what this man's saying. To live consciously, courageously, and to resonate with love and compassion, to awaken the great spirits within others, and to leave this world in peace. That's his, that's his um, created purpose. That's his purpose in life. Another uh, site I came across, this is actually supposedly a Christian site. It says this, if you are tired of feeling insignificant, if you are tired of feeling invisible in a crowd, it's time to receive Jesus' offering of a new life. So we don't need to talk about repentance. We're just, if you're insignificant or if you're invisible in a crowd, we need to get a new life here. He says it begins with a simple prayer. Now listen to how many me or I's or my is in this prayer. Dear Jesus, I am sorry for the wrong things I have done. I am tired of feeling insignificant. I want to have a relationship with you. Please become the Lord of my life. Thank you for seeing the value in me. If I'm a sinner, I have no value. And helping me see myself through your eyes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Then it says at the bottom, if you prayed that prayer, please click on the button above that says, yes, I prayed the prayer. We will contact you soon. This is supposedly a Christian site. Nowhere, again, does the purpose have anything to do with the glory of God, God uh, honoring God. It has to do with me being insignificant about my feelings. And when someone is outside the will of God, searching the out, from the outside of the will of God, they always come up to the same conclusions. It's always about self. It's never about what God's will is, it's what my will is. So, what are some things that people might say? What makes me most happy? What do I want to do with my own life? What do I do to become wealthy? What do I do to satisfy what I want? And as Steve Plavina says again, what is my purpose in life? And then we have one of my, one of my favorite guys, like Steve has his favorite guy, I have mine. What, uh, no, that's, uh, that's, that's his, yeah. What on earth am I here for? This is the purpose-driven life. And on page 70, Rick Warren says, The greatest tragedy is not death, but life without purpose. I would have to say, 
the greatest tragedy is death without Christ. It does not have to do with a purpose. It has to do with Christ. He also says, bring enjoyment to God, bringing enjoyment to God, living for His pleasure is the first purpose of your life. When you fully understand this truth, you will never again have a problem with feeling insignificant. It proves your worth. That's what he says on page 63 of the Purpose Driven Life. Again, it's all about my feelings, not about raising and honoring and glorifying God. And the list goes on. But what we see in the natural man's thoughts, it always comes back to me. And if I'm thinking of me, who am I glorifying? Me. Glorifying myself. Why did God create man? We see in Genesis 1, 26 through 31, that God, we have these three plurals. We have us and our twice. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Did God really need us? I don't think so. He, he was never alone from the very beginning. It was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They had perfect relationship, perfect communion with each other. They had no need of us. They were together all times. In verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created man in the likeness of himself, male and female, because God always glorifies himself in what he does. He's creating male and female in his likeness or his image so man would be glorifying God and God again would be glorified be glorifying himself and why does he do that because he can he's God he can do whatever he wants whenever he wants to whomever he wants and he will always be glorified in every situation His created being in the likeness of the Creator would glorify His Creator in all that he has, been, he has been given, all that God has for Him to do, and also to have that relationship with Him. But this is before sin came into the world. Everything was perfect. Everything was right. Everything was good. Now there was also another uh, miraculous thing that God did with the male and female is he gave, he gave them bodies in order to have children. To, to be fruitful and multiply was what he said. The only way God's creation can multiply was that God divinely made these bodies in order to do so. And that's a, that is a miracle in itself. And I am glorifying God with the thought that I have four daughters. And that's the way that he brought them into the world, was through us. Then in verse 28, it says, God blessed them. He blessed them, and in doing so, he glorifies himself in his own creation. And in verse 31, it says, And he saw everything that he had made, it was very good. God glorifies himself. Why? Because he can and he deserves to be so. Because he is God and all that, it, all that God is is good. He is very good. In return, his creation, his created likeness would also be given him glory for all that he has provided for him in the garden. The entire garden, with the exception of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All God created was for His glory. So how did, and how did our created pur purpose begin? Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, 
and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So just as Steve said last week, God gave them everything. Everything that they needed, God gave them. And because he gave it to them and what, that what they needed, it was always perfect. There was nothing that they did not need. He provided everything for them. In other words, you need nothing else. You have everything totally perfect that I've given you. You need absolutely nothing else. Now, Adam, we're going to go through the two Adams, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. And we're going to see just why our creative purpose is to glorify God. Adam was the first representation of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 45a says, The first man, Adam, became a living being. He became a living being because God breathed his own into Adam. He was not God or a God. Some people think that, will say that he was in the likeness or the image, therefore he was God. Well, um, Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me there is no God. Adam is not a God. God does not share his glory with another God. He's in the pattern of God. He's in the likeness. He's in the image only. He lived in the stage of innocence. In other words, a childlike thought. He had no, he had no idea of anything of sinful nature. He had no idea of disobedience. It was a childlike thought that he had. He would have no knowledge of sin. And he was not separated from God. He walked with God. He was in perfect harmony and relationship with God. God created man in, in, who in turn, having perfect relationship with his creator, would be glorifying God through what God had created for him. Above all creation, God, man was God's treasure. He was his crown. He made, him, made man in his own likeness made man to have a perfect relationship with, made man so man would give his creator all glory. He became the finality of all creation and God saw that it was good. He lived in perfect harmony with God and just as God was the ruler of all, he gave man to be the ruler and have all dominion over all the creation. With authority, that God gave him the power to be over the dominion over his creation. The image of God becomes corrupted. Romans 5, 12 through 14 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through, this, through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin counted, but sin is counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. And Steve talked about this last week. Adam, through his sin, imputed sin, a sin nature to us. We've been given a sin nature because of what Adam had done. And like Steve said last week, people might say, well, how can I be accountable for what Adam did? Well, it's an imputed, it's a transfer, it's an inherited condition that we have. There's a typo. What's that? Not counted. Okay, sin is not counted. <laughs> All right, Kirk, take over. <laughs> Thank you. There is not. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you, Steve, flowers. <laughs> Imputed sin comes from Adam to man. Man becomes a fallen creature. This is the nature that has been transferred to all men through Adam. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That doesn't mean that we have fallen once. It means that every time we've sinned, we continue to fall. It's not just one time. It's a continuation of falling. But because of what Christ has done, we can confess these, this, our sins and we can be right back in communion with God. Justified. All of what the first representation of God had stood for, obedient with God, in perfect harmony with God, blessed by God, and spiritually alive, because of sin, all mankind is now at enmity with God. He is now rebellious toward God. He is in total separation from God. He is cursed by sin. And he is spiritually dead. Yes? I need my class to know. Can you repeat that? What you just said? You know what he was just saying. Oh, I didn't do it? Up there. I didn't write down? Okay. Because of sin, mankind is at enmity with God. I thought I had it up there. Okay. He is now rebellious toward God. He is in total separation from God. He is cursed by sin. And he is spiritually dead. There, there we go. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not good with PowerPoints. I, I could have Steve help me back there, but that's okay. And all who come after the first Adam, we all have this same problem. We all, this is what we have inherited from the first Adam. We are all in the same position until something happens something has to happen for all these things not to be wiped away but one day totally gone yes there's a, sub a substitutionary work that comes into play from a second Adam the New Testament Jesus Christ the image of God is manifested in the second Adam 1 Corinthians 15, 45b, the last Adam became the life-giving spirit. And 1 Corinthians 15, 47 says, the first man was from the dust, the second man is from heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.3 gives us a very good illustration of just who Jesus was, what, in, in, how he resembled God. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. Everything that God is was exact in Christ. Everything that God is was not exact in Adam. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. By his words, power comes out. He is the purifier of sins. He's the only person that can purify a, person's, a person of their sins. And after he purified sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high.
And we have Isaiah 7, 14 and Matthew 23 that tell us that He is God. And He's God with us. I like to think of Christ as the walking Word. He's the walking Word of God. Now when Christ comes, we know that He lives that perfect life, sinless life. And He had to do so in order that He would be able to pay the price for us so we in turn can be forgiven for our sins, our transgressions. He is God. And I love how Hebrews 1.3 describes all that. He is the radiance of His glory, the exact imprint of His nature. He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And he is a purifier of sins. And when he's finished, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The image of God is restored in the new Adam, Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the image of God we can't see, but we can see His attributes. And, I, and I, was, I kept pondering on how the disciples could not see him as God until Jesus actually told them, you've seen, you've, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And they still didn't get it. But to think that God in flesh was walking amongst, amongst them blows my mind. How would that feel today if, God, if Christ were to walk in? What would we do? Would we do what the dis- disciples Oh, that can't be him. Would we do the same thing? Jesus was the highest in rank before creation. He never was created, and he was all over all creation. Man needed another Adam to come in the exact imprint, the perfect representation, the perfect person of God, in order for perfect reconciliation to occur from God. Man staying with with sin lost his relationship with God. Therefore, only God can make perfect reconciliation and restore that relationship. John 1, 12, 13 says, But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, who gave the right to become children of God, who born not of blood, nor the will of of the flesh, nor will of man, but of God. The only way we could ever come to God was not by something we can devise. It was only by the will of God that man could come to God. That God would receive man was because of what God's will is, not ours. When we see Jesus, we see in John 5.19 what man was supposed to be, obedient to the Father. We see in Hebrews 4.13, perfect in holiness. We see in Philippians 2.6 and 7, he was perfectly humble. God in flesh became a servant. We see in Hebrews 12, 2, perfect joy. The perfect joy of God Christ longs for us to have. And number five, John 10, 30. We've got three different, two chapters here. John 10, 30, 17, 11, and 17, 21. A perfect, unbroken fellowship with the Father. This is what he desires for us. So we talked about a couple weeks weeks back, the last time I spoke, we talked about imputed righteousness. We 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 were imputed with sin from Adam, but now 
Christ imputes his righteousness to us. His righteousness to fallen chosen man through the blood of Christ is on the cross. Condemned man is separated from God because of the imputed transfer of sin. Through Adam, the first Adam, sin and spiritual death was imputed to all men. I got up there? Am I up there? Okay, good. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, we have his righteousness imputed to us, but we also have forgiveness, reconciliation, and salvation is to given to all who believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Acts 4, 12, it says, there is, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The work of Christ on the cross restored the relationship between fallen man back to God. Yes? Okay, so conceptually, we were made in the image of God. God breathed that, and that image had to do with the biggest sense of the spiritual nature to it. Right. Out of sins, the spiritual nature is gone, died. Christ comes in and restores that aspect by by giving us forgiveness, reconciliation. So now we're restored back. The spiritual nature is now restored back into that image of God which we can now reflect. Right. What you're yes. Yes. We are, we, are, we are the mirror. If we're, In other words, you're looking in the mirror and you see yourself. But at the same time, God sees us with Christ. He sees us as His Son. We placed His Son on us that we could be a reflection a representation of Christ a restoration of the image of Christ. yes restoration or even regenerated yes restoration in return restored I just I just wrote this down you said it in return, restored or regenerated man can do nothing but give God all glory for what Christ had done on the cross for him as a substitutionary sacrifice on our behalf to save us from the wrath that God had planned for those who turn away and reject his son. Restored relationship. That's right. Restored spiritually. I gave a... Uh, uh, an illustration to a, a kid the other day at Golden West that, uh, and I've I've explained it in here before. If you have two you have two deaths and you have two births, but if you think about it, the Christian has two births and one death. The one who rejects the one who's not saved has one birth and two deaths. And he kind of looked at me like, what? I said, well, the Christian is born of a physical birth on earth. And because of his sins, he turns, he, it, Christ restore, it bring, he dies for him on the cross, saves him, and gives him a spiritual birth, a new birth in Christ. Therefore, when we die as, as believers... We die once, a physical death, because we have a spiritual life that's going to come after. The one who's not saved has a physical birth, but because he's not restored, he's never given his life to Christ, he's still spiritually dead. So here's his first death, and then because he dies a physical death, there's his second death. And because that spiritual death, you now are going to be facing your judgment, and you're going to be in hell that for eternity so that restoration that that physical birth we have but then we have that spiritual birth is what we're longing for through Christ to see other people have that same spiritual birth how is God glorified through us John 15 7 and 8 by creating us in his own glory, 
and for us to glorify Him. It says, If you abide in Me, and My words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And verse 8 says this, By this My Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be My disciples. What type of fruit are we bearing? Are people seeing Christ-like fruit being bore out in, out in the community to your friends and family? That they might say, this guy, this person here, he, this guy's a really strong Christian guy. You can tell by the way he lives. Examples through your life. How much, what kind of fruit are we bearing? And if we're bearing that fruit, what does it say? That so to prove to be my disciples. The fruit we bear are going to prove whether we're truly disciples of Christ or not. And then Isaiah 43, 6 and 7, 7 being the main verse, but it says, we were created for His glory. Verse 6 says, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of from the end of the earth. Verse 7, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. He created us for His glory. That's the bottom line. There's no other, no other reason why He would create man was to glorify Him. Now the Christian person, we that, that are here, we can absolutely give Him all glory because of what He's done. We know what He's done. We've been convicted over what He's done. But the unregenerate person, the person who's lost, they can't give God glory because it's, God is so far from them that they can't see Him to give Him glory. It's giving glory to self is what they normally do. Now when God saves them, what are they going to do? They're going to give Him the absolute glory for what He's done for them. Because the realization is that they agree with what God has done. They agree with the fact that they are sinners. They're in agreement with everything that God has for them outside of salvation. And now because of salvation, they are in total agreement with God. And giving Him glory in doing so. Now this word uh, called... In the Hebrew, to call, to summon, announce, to be invited as a guest, to be appointed. This is the, what it means in the Hebrew. And there, in the Greek, the word is kaleo, to call in one, to one, into one's presence, to summon, to send for. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. What's His purpose? That He would be glorified through us. But this word called has this, a meaning that is, is an uh, illustration of somebody in a high court, a high court position, or of royalty sends out somebody with a piece of paper to summon you into his court or into his council. It's an invitation that you cannot turn down. And when it says that God is calling people, that you've been called, it's a divine summon that when he is drawing you to himself and he is changing who you are spiritually and from the heart, you can't turn that down. Kenneth Wiest says the calling here and elsewhere spoken of by the apostle is the working in men of the everlasting purpose of God whereby before the foundations of the world were laid he hath decreed by his counsel secret to us to deliver from the curse and damnation those whom He has chosen in Christ out of mankind, and to bring them by Christ to everlasting salvation. It is not by the craftiness of our thoughts that we think that we can manipulate God in some way to say that it was all about me. I'm the one that did this. 
when it's God calling, God choosing, God adopting us. Therefore, when I think about that, I can't stop thinking Him. I can't stop thanking Him for what He's done. And therefore, coming back to what I was saying, over the last four months, my life has been drastically changed. With the, Not so much changed in a way that is something that I can't handle, but changes in my life with people that are gone. Um, January 3rd, my grandmother passed away at 94. That was, we kind of expected that, you know, at her age. But to think that she had lived her life out as a young girl, just all about God, all about the Bible, ministering to other people, was we saw that coming and we were ready for it but in february my dad got sick and we didn't know exactly what was going on we knew that he something was wrong and that he was losing weight and we knew you know my mom and my brother and my sister kind of felt like there's got to be some treatment you know that could help out and when a test came back that said it was inconclusive their hopes shot up Mine, on the other hand, I could see his body kind of deteriorating. So I kind of figured that there was something a lot more going on than any treatment's going to you know, give to him. So in February, he's got, he got sick. And in March, it got even worse. And then on March 30th, we found out, we actually found out what it was on, on March 23rd, and he was gone by the 30th. And then, when I thought, that's over with, I don't know if you ever saw uh, the car that I was driving was a 94 Mustang GT, and it was my dad's, and he gave it to me about two years ago. He hadn't quite written over the ownership yet, but he was going to, and I'm very thankful, actually, that he didn't, <laughs> because two weeks later, after his passing, I got in an accident, and we totaled the Mustang. And so all these things are compiling and I'm thinking to myself, God, what's next? What do you have for me? What's, what's coming next? You know, and I'm okay. I'm okay with everything that's going on. But what happened was that the appraiser came to look at the Mustang and he asked my mom, <clears throat> who was driving this car? And she said, my son was. And he says, how is your son? She said, fine. He said, really? He's fine? He says, because all the accidents that I do, whoever was sitting in this car should have been drastically hurt. She goes, no. He walked out. And so I got to thinking about it that day, that night after the accident. Um, I kept pacing up and down the street where I was doing my lessons. My lessons were over. So I was waiting for my wife to come pick me up. I kept pacing back and forth, and all I could think about was James 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Pacing back and forth, just constantly repeating that, those verses. <clears throat> so I have a lot to be thankful for but more so giving God all the glory for what he has done, not just with my grandmother, but my dad as well. Because my dad was the one that I was concerned about that he may not have been saved. But as I found out later on, uh, right about the time he passed, that he was, he was saved. So we, uh, we had his memorial uh, last Saturday. And the last things I said was that I, the conversation that my dad and I had were, it was on that Friday morning on the 24th. And we spoke for about two hours. And the conversation was, uh, was the best conversation ever. 
he disclosed so much stuff to me that I had never known about the, what he felt, where his heart was. And one of the things he said was, I, he goes, I need you to know something. I need you to know that I love Jesus Christ for what he did on the cross for me. And I was kind of thrown back because he's never said anything to me about his faith. And then he said, and I want you to know this, that I am so thankful that God brought me back. So in his, in, in the last thing he asked me that night was, uh, if I had the answer to his question that nobody seems to be answering. And I asked him what the question was, and he said, how much time do I have? And I said, I, I don't know. I don't know that answer because nobody's told me anything about it. And he goes, okay. So at my dad's memorial, one of the things I wanted to bring up was the fact that uh, what God and Christ had done in my dad's life. Not so much talking about the memories because that was kind of redundant. I wanted to do something a little different. So at the end of the, at the, end of the, the um, my talk, I said exactly what we just, what I said here, that he was, he loved Christ for what he did on the cross, that he was very thankful that God brought him back. And then the question was, how much time did he have? So I decided I needed to ask my dad some questions. And I said, if God were to uh, allow me to, permit me to ask my dad questions where he's at right now, I would ask him this. What is it like to be in perfect holiness? What is it like to be uh, in the presence and the glory of God? And what is it like to know that you are complete and without sin? And my last question was, Dad, how much time do you have now? So now you know how much the last four months, God has been getting the glory day in and day out. Other ways we can glorify God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are, brought, you are bought with a price. So, you glorify God in your body. Our body is a temple. I chewed tobacco for 24 years. And as you, as you know about you know, my dad, I didn't tell you that he actually, pancreatic cancer was what got to him. But cancer runs in my family. And so for 24 years, that was an idol to me. It was something that I liked to do, something that I wanted around me when I was playing baseball. And God took it away one day. And it was something that I no longer need. I no longer have a desire to do. But when I got to thinking about it, when I got saved in 2000, I was coaching and I was still chewing. And I thought to myself, what kind of example am I, am I setting before these young players? If I'm saying that I'm a Christian and here I'm chewing, I mean, I'm not talking about legalistic things. Whatever somebody wants to do, that's up to them. But in my opinion for myself was I am not glorifying God by putting something into my body, this temple, that is supposed to be honoring Christ for what he did on the cross and honoring the Holy Spirit who he is going to work in this temple. So not only are we to glorify God in our works that He's given us, given us to evangelize, giving us to serve the body of Christ, giving us to go out and help others, like um, help widows, help or orphans, whatever we're called to do. We're doing it through this body as a representation of Christ. And we should be glorifying God and Christ in our bodies as well. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. Do all things. He's not just saying just whatever you eat and drink. It's everything that you do. 
do to the glory of God. Now Philippians 1, that's not up on the board, but Philippians 1, 9 and 11 says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with the knowledge and all discernment, so that you may, be, may approve what is excellent, and so to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's what our purpose is for. For the praise and the glory of God in all the things that He has done for us. Romans 16, 25 through 27. Okay. <clears throat> says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what our purpose is for. If there's anything that goes outside of Christ for another purpose, it's not going to be glorifying to Christ. It won't be glorifying to God if it's outside of Christ. On the back of your papers, on the last page, there is a song. And many of you probably know it. The title of it, My Tribute, is one that confused me when I first saw it. But when I saw the chorus, I knew exactly what it was. But that, that song goes very well with what our created purpose is for. To God be the glory. And I'm going to have Andy sing it right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm not going to do that. So, this was uh, a time I was, I'm thankful to Steve and for Kirk and Pastor Bill because during that time with my dad, it was, uh, it was very tough for me to go get into the studies because there were times where I needed to go to my mom and dad's house to actually stay overnight and help my mom watch my dad. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you this, you know, my uncle, who my dad's brother is a retired pastor, and he and I had a talk, and I asked him, you know, what did you and my dad talk about? And he said, Gary, for three weeks, we talked every day on the phone. And he said, some of the things we talked about was a lot of you know, reminiscing about our lives as kids and with our parents and things we did. He said, but did you know that every single time that God, Christ, salvation, heaven, hell, forgiveness was brought up, it was always brought up by your dad. He was the one that instigated all the talks about Christ. And then he said, uh, you know, we have this, this little the indicator, this little meter thing that goes on. It's, he goes, the Holy Spirit gives us this little detector that when you're talking to somebody and they're telling you their theology, their own beliefs, and it's not scriptural, that little detector goes off. And you go, hey, wait, wait, let's talk a little bit about what you're saying. He goes, talking to your dad, that detector never went off. He goes, I knew by what he was telling me that his faith was real. And then he said, and being a pastor, do you really think that I would let your dad go to hell without giving him the gospel first? So okay, you're right. So with all that assurance that he had, that my, my uh, uncle was talking to me about, then I spoke to Pastor Bobby as well. And Pastor Bobby said, well, we always have to go back to the thief on the cross. 
because he couldn't get off the cross to go do a bunch of good things and get back on the cross and say, here I am. I did all these good things. He said, that's what we always have to go back to, to know that the, the grace and the mercy and salvation that Christ gives to us can happen at any moment, whether it's while we're walking around or whether we're on our deathbed or whatever. But the fact is that your dad acknowledged it all. I said, okay. He goes, now he goes, I think you can be encouraged. And I think you can have that assurance. So now you know why it's been so long since I've been up here. But again, the glory to God for everything that he has done for us. And for the last four months. So.